Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's the month of December, <clears throat> and uh, people already get into the holiday mood. So uh, attendance tends to drop off. I said, let me put at least a title which is interesting. I'm not so sure about the talk, but uh, that seems to have worked. At least a few people are here in the audience. Uh, on screen, we have the upcoming dates for. FOF, eighteenth uh, January, Thursday, and twenty second Feb, Thursday. Please make a note so uh, we'll be having the event uh, on these dates. So this is the topic we are going to cover today. What to do once you are rich? Uh, it's been almost fifteen years since we have been conducting the forum, and people who have been either attending or watching the YouTube videos hopefully are on their way to becoming rich. Uh, if not, you will get there as long as you are disciplined and you stick to the path of sensible investing. So, what to do after you are rich? So, uh, that is also an important uh, aspect to cover. A lot of confusing terms are thrown about. So, People talk about financial planning. People talk about wealth management. Some very, very rich people talk about starting their family offices. Uh, so what's all this confusion about? I'll describe how people refer to this in the marketplace, but I'll be using these terms more or less interchangeably and I'll tell you why. Uh, financial planning is supposed to be for everyone. So even a young person who has recently completed education and who maybe has an education loan and currently no other net worth. So technically this person has negative net worth, no financial assets and has borrowings for education. Even such a person will need some sort of a financial plan. Uh, how much money will go in EMI towards education loan, what is the income, how to plan for taxes, how to plan for savings, uh, whatever is left over. So everyone needs a financial plan unless you are a monk living in the Himalayas and uh, who has no income, no expenses and no assets, then you don't need a financial plan. But pretty much everyone else needs a financial plan. Wealth management, as probably you would have understood in, the, in terms of the term itself, refers to people who have accumulated certain amount of savings, who have a certain amount of wealth, and then they are looking for advice to manage that. And typically, family office is referred to the ultra-rich uh, people having hundreds of crores or maybe thousands of crores and who uh, put up a board outside their office saying, family, this family, family office, uh, they would put their surname and put a family office after that uh, and hire investment professionals and uh, accountants and stuff like that to manage money for their own uh, group. I think these distinctions don't really matter to what I'm going to be talking about. Reason being that uh, people go through different stages in their life cycle and people may move from one to the other uh, and not necessarily linearly. So what looks like a family today, suddenly once you have the parents and children and spouses, everyone fighting, then it suddenly becomes a financial plan instead of wealth management. Then there are messy divorces to uh, go through and a lot of litigations to go through. So recently we have a... Uh, family in the news, business family in the news, where virtually everyone seems to be fighting with everyone else. So uh, these distinctions don't really matter. Uh, we will be covering aspects which are relevant for all individuals and to for some people a little more, for some others maybe a little less. And the other reason why I think this distinction does not make sense is that India is somewhat different from the 
Western countries. So in the Western countries, you would have heard of this uh, formula for deciding your asset allocation between equity and debt, where your equity allocation should be 100 minus your age. So if you are 25, then 75% of the money should be equity and 25 in debt. And as you grow older, your equity allocation should come down and debt allocation should go up. Now, this formula is working under the presumption that you are living, you are accumulating your savings for your own consumption. And the goal is to die with zero money in your bank account, right? So, to initially accumulate and then spend it all on yourself or maybe your spouse. In India, we don't think like that. So, in India, we, so in the West, you have concepts like reverse mortgages, which are gaining popularity or already very popular and uh, stuff like that. Here, intuitively, irrespective of the size of assets that a family has, people think generationally. Uh, people normally have this thinking that even in retirement, I should be consuming out of the return on my capital. I should not be consuming my capital. So, if you have a bank FT, you will typically try to contain your expenses within that interest rather than consume some principal out of it. Uh, so many a times uh, I find it somewhat amusing that very, very rich families or very, very rich individuals who are maybe in their late 70s, early 80s, who are not even consuming the dividend income that they get on the shares that they have. So let us say they have shares worth 100 and they are getting one and a half rupees as dividend, their annual expenses would be maybe 50 paise. Now, these people are not going, not planning on consuming their accumulated wealth in their lifetime at all. But still they'll say, oh, I am now old, should I reduce my equity allocation? My question to them is, are you going to spend all this money? And they say, no. I ask the next question, who is this money for? The answer is, this is for my children. Then the allocation is driven by your children's age, not your age. Uh, so, again, it's not just a question of what is the size of your net worth. It is a question of what is your mental framework. Are you thinking of money, wealth as a family unit or are you thinking individually or only for you and your spouse maybe? Uh, depending on that, all the other decisions will flow through. Uh, most people in India, at least anecdotally, at least in terms of my interaction, operate more on a family basis rather than on an individualistic basis. So that's where this uh, topic and uh, this approach of thinking as a family. Someone was mentioning before the start of the presentation that the topic is worded in such a way that you could talk about a lot of things. What are you exactly going to talk about today? And the that's precisely the point. Don't expect to get all the answers today itself. Uh, today, initially, I'll outline what all aspects are involved, at least some of the aspects that are involved in thinking about uh, your finances and your money. Uh, and from the whole outline, from all the topics listed, I'll pick up one topic and discuss that. And the remaining topics we'll discuss in future uh, such presentations, as in when uh, time permits. So typically we cover companies or sectors or other broad trends. But this is a topic where I felt there was a very big need uh, among investors because they may be getting their... Uh, equity investments right, but they may be fumbling on some of the other aspects of uh, their finances. So, I'll be covering those. So, broadly, we could be talking about investments, how much to put in debt, how much to put in equity, how much in real estate, gold, whatever, various asset classes. And within that, what vehicle to use, should you put money in the mutual fund, should you put money in a PMS or AIF, should you, uh, what are the measures that you can 
adopt to optimize your taxation uh which are the good managers and how do you know which is a good manager to select and which is a bad manager to select so all these aspects could come about in the field of investing also once you become rich uh you want to brag about your investments in parties right so uh saying that you have a index fund in your bmat account doesn't give you any bragging rights as compared to that let us say you owned shares in open ai you would be probably wearing a t-shirt to that effect and proclaiming to the world that i own open ai or something like that so uh, alternatives are a big attraction for rich people so today we'll be talking more about alternatives uh again family business is a very very interesting and tricky aspect of uh things and this does not necessarily just apply to very very wealthy people in fact for the mid tier families it is even more of a tricky question so if some family is very very wealthy and owning a very very large listed company where shares are very very liquid then valuation thing the things don't matter so much there's a public market valuation available uh, and even though the business may be indivisible one party can sell shares another party can buy shares relatively simpler but let us say you have a privately held business business is one let us say there are three inheritors how do you pass on the assets to the next gen so those are the kind of complications that arise from a family business again they if maybe all three are to inherit the one family business should family members be employed in the business not employed in the business how much role should professional managers have what are the guardrails which hello yeah check. sorry about that yeah so as i was saying in a family business a lot of these different aspects come about within the family who will inherit it who will run the business uh should family owners run the business or not run the business what are the equations that will guard the uh relationships between the business owners and the professional managers so all these aspects come to the fore so this is not a topic for today but maybe something we'll discuss uh in the future and also link closely linked to the family business is the relationships between the individual family members and uh how they get along with each other so that is uh, a very very important thing it's not cut and dried like this percentage share to this much and uh then uh you just look at the finances of the business but it is also important to understand the aspirations the motivations for different individuals and then decide how the business is going to be run and how the uh, management responsibilities are going to be divided in the west and we have seen even in india that there is a concept called shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve in three generations what this means is that the founder is someone who comes from a very humble background uh develops understanding of a segment or of a industry puts in a lot of hard work and effort and creates something very very valuable his or her offsprings carry on the legacy and really build on that foundation uh sometimes they are able to just about maintain it sometimes they are able to grow it but when it comes to the third generation the grandchildren of the founder those people have been born into riches those people have a very lavish lifestyle those people don't have the necessary work ethic and then they they typically end up running the business to ground uh and in the west at least it's very rare for the fourth generation to uh 
really handle the wealth responsibly. By the time the third generation ends, it is pretty much over. Uh, a very, very well-known and uh, popular example of this is the Vanderbilt family. And there's a wonderful book on this uh, called Fortune's Children uh, as to how uh, from being a w the wealthiest family in America, how they virtually had nothing by the time the uh, third generation came about. So, how to guard against this? And again, this is third generation is the outer limit. Sometimes you have examples of celebrities becoming bankrupt in their own lifetime. So, Boris Becker, the famous tennis player, declared bankruptcy and he was found guilty of uh, some malpractices and actually spent time behind bars uh, for maybe one or two years. So how to guard against these kind of things is another topic to be uh, discussed. Then increasingly these days you have the challenges of uh, one generation being in India and some other generation being outside India. Uh, so you have parents living here, children some of them here, some of them abroad, how to uh, transfer assets to the foreign inheritors, what are the tax implications, what are, what are the legal implications, uh, what are the special laws which govern at least in major countries like maybe US and UK and Middle East, we could talk about those kind of things, we could talk about things like the PIFIC regulations in the US which govern simple things like investments of U.S. residents in foreign mutual funds. So, uh, these are the regulations which are to be kept in mind. We will be briefly touching on the uh, other aspects of uh, things like lifestyle and philanthropy. Now, these are not moral science lectures that I am wanting to give. But people who have read the history of France remember that Mary Antoinette famously said, if the peasants don't have bread, they can eat cake. And then the revolution started and people started getting beheaded. In India, we have a famous business person who was not paying salaries to the employees for five months, six months. The family members were committing suicide. And this person was throwing lavish parties. And finally, he had to run away from India. So, uh, those kind of things happen and one has to be aware of some of these aspects. Uh, a lot of these things are matters of personal choice, but there has to be limits on either side as to uh, how you conduct yourself. And finally, the important aspects of succession planning, uh, how to handle things like uh, Tra private trusts, how to handle things like uh, wills, uh, what are the aspects of uh, estate taxes, inheritance taxes, what is the difference between the two, what is the difference between, let's say, something like a estate tax and in inheritance tax. Uh, India does not have those right now, how to take advantage of that, what are the implications of giving gifts. So we will cover a lot of these aspects as we go along in uh, many of the future sessions. So, which brings us to today's topic uh, on alternatives. So, alternatives are typically uh, things which are not the mainstream investment assets. Uh, typically, people have this fascination for startups, for new companies which have the potential to give a lot of returns to investors. So private companies, things like private equity funds, uh, again, alternative investment vehicles, things like hedge funds. In India, they're called AIFs, where they could be running leverage strategies or they could be running long shots. There would be outside managers like in PMSs and things like that. So we will be discussing some of these aspects today. All kids, before they turn 18, they have this aspiration to quickly turn 18 so that they can drink, they can smoke, they can gamble, 
they can drive cars they can vote do all the things that grown ups can do right same way people who don't have that much saving have this fascination oh if only i had 50 lakhs i could invest in the pms only if only i had 1 crore i could invest in some eif if only i had maybe a few tens of crores of savings i could buy all these private unlisted companies so what applies to grown ups and kids also applies to individual investors and wealthy investors yeah so a rich person can do all these kind of things it's important to remember that not everything that you are allowed to do you should be doing i'll not get on to the topic of marriage but at least things like smoking and drinking are not exactly good for your health voting you should definitely do maybe get a driving license but essentially not everything that you are allowed to do is in your interest so we have discussed some of the things that rich individuals can do one of the things that they can do is they can invest in venture capital i don't know what this girl is dreaming about but most wealthy individuals when they are daydreaming they dream of this oh if only i had got shares of bona sa at 1 rupee a share that would be worth 380 today if only i had bought amazon when it was a young company or all these kind of things people dream about and uh, that is their big regret in life that they could not participate in a lot of uh, these things so this is equivalent to saying if only i had started giving screen tests when i was in my late teens or early 20s i would be shahrukh khan today and i would be so famous and i would be so rich and things like that so it's important to understand the base rates here surely if you can become a shahrukh khan or a ranbir kapoor or a alia bhat or a deepika padukone it's a very very lucrative and fulfilling career but most people don't end up there most people are dancing in some corner as a junior artist somewhere who you don't even notice in a song with a lot of dancers or in the war scene they would be uh, foot soldiers somewhere so that is the story of venture capital and to some extent private equity so returns are very very skewed now skewness and kurtosis is a technical term which we uh, read about in statistics which at least when i was studying went over my head i did not understand it too, too much let's understand what this skewed term means a lot of the data about venture capital is not available publicly so uh, organizations like cambridge associates and uh, mercer and all track this data very very closely but that is not publicly available and uh, you have to pay hefty subscriptions to get that data so uh, i don't have data to share in that great uh, detail uh, it's unlike the value research or money control or something like that prime minister investor where you can find the returns of each and every fund that is out there these are private investments and the return details are not available but this is an interesting blog post which has uh, done some analysis on some of the uh, investments in the private space in the us markets what does this chart show on the left hand side you see these two tall buildings these are the investments where even the principal amount did not come back so you you invested 
you either got zero or something less than hundred. Maybe you got back fifty. Maybe you got back seventy. These are investments which did very very poorly. This segment. This accounts for more than half of the total amount invested. So if you put hundred rupees in a fund, fifty one of that did not even give you your principal back and. by number of companies invested it amounted to as much as 2/3 of the companies on the extreme right hand side less than 1% of the money invested generated more than 20x so if you think that you would have bought all these shares on the cheap and they would have multiplied that would happen in 1 out of 100 cases that is not the usual base rate and there are numerous studies both in the west and in the east we have spoken to big investors in the private space their experience net net has been that venture capital investments that they have done have on an average done as much as the public market investments are slightly lower so which is the bad news some people of course do very very well i am not saying that everyone has done badly but the averages are not that great average most likely is below the index returns uh, in the west as well as in india the bad news does not end there there's more bad news because a lot of people think that just because you have money in the bank account you can go out and buy anything that you want uh your checkbook is powerful and you'll get all these fabulous deals you just have to identify the right one you have all these popular shows like shark tank where you sit as a rich investor and everyone will come in front of you and try and pitch you business ideas and you can reject business ideas or you can accept business ideas it's almost as if you are in a swamber you have this garland and you can choose your spouse and it's your for the taking bad news it doesn't work that way this is a screenshot from google ventures where they say we support innovative founders and help them move forward let us say you think gitlab is a great investment great company to invest in stripe is a great company to invest in do you think founders of gitlab and stripe are waiting for you to bring your checkbook or will come before you and pitch and if you reject they'll quietly go away or if you accept they'll happily take your money and a lot shares to you answer is no GitLab and Stripe will want investors like Google Ventures. They will not give their shares to to put it colloquially, era gera na thu gera. They will not give shares to anyone and everyone. This is the screenshot from Rain Matter, which is run by Zero Da. They fund a lot of companies. they have investments in things like small case and tijori these are names that people in financial markets would have heard of would have heard of small case and tijori let us say you think that small case is a great business idea you think small case founders will give you shares or you think tijori founders will give you shares why have they given shares to zeroda because zeroda is the one of the leading brokers in india with a huge market share now small case and things like tijori if they are able to integrate with zero das platform that would add a lot of value to them so small case and tijori will be open to offer stakes to leading stock brokers in india but just because you have 5 crores or 10 crores doesn't mean you are eligible to buy shares in these kind of companies if you are a company like infoage 
you will be able to invest with companies like zomato if you are a unknown person zomato founders may not be interested in giving shares to you if you are ether the electric two wheeler company you will offer shares to hero moto corp in this case but they could might as well have gone with aishar or bajaj or tvs they say offer shares to these people because there's strategic fit and there's value that they get from offering those those stakes they are not going to just take money from anyone open ai a lot of people would think that sam altman is a great founder and we want to invest with him does that mean that sam altman will offer shares to you no they will offer shares to microsoft why because microsoft is able to give them a lot of computing power for cheap and see them through their journey uh, and open open ai can integrate with the bing search so there has to be some value for founders also apart from money it is not just about your ability to give them funding to get shares of nike or mama earth for cheap you have to be either shilpa shetty or alia bhat or katrina kaif with my face if you go to fund they'll probably ask 1000 rupees a share and this is the interesting part unlike public market investments where once you fill the form write a check that's the end of the story things get more complicated here even after you have made the investment here it is about getting your hands dirty it it's not clean cut like just write a check you have to actually get your hands dirty what do i mean by that sometimes after you put in money in a company the company's founder will come back and sue you and then you have to fight all the way to the supreme court which was in the last case they will personally sue you your family and things like that in the top right even if you are a running a big listed company and you have funded a startup that startup will founder will refuse to answer your phone calls and emails and then you have to file a court case against them people will take your money and run away it, it's not so in the private space they are not subject to sebi disclosure norms or all the regulations that apply to a listed company they could issue shares to you at 100 next day you have to be careful they are not issuing shares to someone else at 50 they could issue esops left right and center and dilute you uh so all sorts of things happen in that space it's not just over after you have done the investment the other thing is that if at all you get entry into the promising companies it will not be in the first one or two or three rounds it will be after the company has achieved a certain amount of scale and then you will buy shares at a higher price and let us say you say i don't want to do all this on my own there's a nice promising fund manager who runs venture capital funds let me with that person fund will get shares in later funding round they may not be able to access at the initial stages also the best venture capital funds are funds where retail investors don't have access these are funds which take money only from people like sovereign wealth funds or university endowments and things like that or they are funds by operating companies so google runs google ventures or infoage has investments in startups zeroda has investments in financial startups 
so we'll have these kind of funds which will deliver the best returns outside funds may not generate so much of return and again the problem is that the expense ratios over there are very very high running expenses plus the profit share if the investment does well a lot of the money will be taken away as fees and finally you have to be wary of the employees of the investi companies because they will look to extract maximum value out of your investments to summarize there was this one line headline that financial times had put out their study said that venture capitalists are mostly just wasting their time and your money so it does it gives you poorer return than index funds it locks up your money it gives you all this heartache and the only people benefiting are the people man managing these funds so again uh, people who have subscription to financial times this is a very interesting article to read and it has some of the data on the uh, performance track records there are a lot of research papers also uh, on this page i think this line uh summarizes it more or less an interesting book which came out recently so this book has been written in anger but read it to figure out what really happens behind the scenes at some of these startup kind of companies and again the risk is that most of these companies operate at the edge of the law this is a old saying it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to get permission but this was more or less the motto of the company uber now to run a taxi service in virtually any city in the world you require permissions uber went and said we we'll launch the service we'll figure out about the legality later on it seems to have somewhat worked for them but most companies operate in gray areas so all the fintechs that you see peer to peer lending for example are there clear cut rbi guidelines on that no they will just start something then uh, there will be some issues and the regulator will come and clamp down and suddenly there will be losses or things like real money gaming all these rummy apps that have floated or the cricket betting apps that have floated uh there is a lot of money from investors suddenly huge gst notices have started coming to them and now you don't know what's the uh, scene uh, so suddenly the whole business model has uh, virtually vanished so that was the wild wild world of uh, venture capital funds the second category is what are called private equity funds here the thing is okay we will not go to these very very risky companies we will invest in somewhat mature businesses where there's established revenue models established profitability the managers have become too complacent they are very lazy we will buy those companies revamp the board cut costs and deliver a great investment return that is the promise of private equity funds i cannot describe this space well enough best is people who are interested should watch one or more of these documentaries stock movies so this is available on youtube this talks about uh, there's a book as well as a movie so you could take your pick uh it's also available on youtube for people who are interested this is about the takeover of rgr nabisco wall street another interesting movie the uh, interesting part is where uh, they take over the airline and try and cut costs and uh, strip all the assets uh, sell all the assets uh borrow a lot of money and things like that so 
this was again interesting you could read up on uh, vg capital and how things went badly at heinz essentially what they are doing is they will come in with 20 rupees or 30 rupees they'll borrow rest of the money let's say they'll borrow 70 rupees from the bank take over a company for 100 once they've taken over the company they will pay out all the surplus cash that is there they will sell office premises go to rental premises they will uh, sell whatever they deem non core assets they will cut discretionary items of expenditure let us say advertising is important for long term growth but if you immediately cut advertising sales are not going to drop the next quarter or next 6 months they will do that they will cut off r and d expenses pay out huge amounts of as dividend take their money out and dump the residual company on someone else even leaving aside the moral aspects for outside investors it's not been that great a deal again aggregate data has not been that good for outside investors even in the private equity space which brings us to things like pms and eif uh, i'll just show some data so this is jan sorry june 2020 roughly 158000 crores was the amount in aifs 3 years back now that has gone up to 350 so from 158 to 350 in a span of 3 years so lot of money is flowing here and i don't mean to be critical of this space our own roots have been in pms so we were running a pms from uh 97 to 2013 and even today we have a pms license we have a small number of clients so i don't mean to run down pmss or aifs but in terms of the costs to the end investor in terms of tax efficiencies mutual fund are better vehicle and the median pms or median aif will do far worse than the uh median mutual fund if there is some specific manager who you wish to invest in and where you are convinced that uh, that investment strategy makes sense and it somewhat differentiated then sure you can go ahead and invest in this space but like i said just don't blindly rush into anything and it may be a good idea but don't get married the moment you turn 18 be selective in terms of your choice of spouse same way be selective in which pmss you invest in or which ai you invest in structured product again this is something which is sold to so called wealthy investors and where they have a huge liking for this the promise here is they will say that oh we will take away all your risk you put in 100 you will get back 100 don't worry at all whether markets go up or markets go down we will protect your capital and if markets go up we will give you the upside as well so uh, it's it looks like having your cake and eating it too but not really so if something sounds too good to be true it probably is so uh, what are the catches in uh, this space of course e the thing here is each wealth manager or each investment bank will be coming out with many many variants of structured products virtually every month so it's not possible to give you the or to examine the features of all of these products and to explain them i'll explain one of the simple products but broadly speaking uh it's not a free lunch there are catches in this space which you should be aware of so let's look at a very very basic structure where someone is saying that we will protect your principal that is one feature of the product they will say we will give you upside 
linked to the nifty so what they call as coupon or the interest rate that return is linked to nifty returns they will package it very well so that you will find it much better than investing in plain vanilla bonds or plain vanilla equity and once you invest usually there's no exit for a period anywhere ranging from one and a half years to three or four years these are the usual features uh, of a structured product so let's take a simple example uh you have let's say 1 lakh to invest now today most banks are offering rates in the region of 7.9% annualized banks offer quarterly interest rate i am taking the annual interest rate so if you invest roughly 79600 in the bank fd ignoring taxes this 79600 will grow to 1 lakh after one year after three years so by this mechanism you can protect your principal amount and with the remaining 20000 odd rupees you can buy nifty call options after 3 years let us say the market goes into a bear market then your call options will be worthless but you still have 1 lakh rupees left with you because that bank fd that you had made that has grown to a amount of 1 lakh rupees so your principal is protected in a downward market let us say the market goes up 50% from 21000 nifty let us say you go to 31500 or somewhere now market has gone up 50% in 3 years your bank fd will anyway grow to 1 lakh but with the 20000 odd rupees that you were left with you were able to buy equity exposure only worth 80000 rupees so that 80000 will go up again 50% and you will get a return of 40000 rupees so in exchange for giving up that 20% equity upside what principal protection in return so that's the basic premise of these structured products now the catch is that what many people don't realize is that when you are buying the ncd of a entity at the top it will be a big name uh maybe a mnc bank or maybe a private sector bank but behind that brand name there will be something called investments private limited or fincorp or something like that so these are not the main entities to whom you are lending money you are not giving money to the bank you are giving money to a subsidiary of the bank or some company formed by a investment bank now if that private limited company does not repay you uh you don't have banking protection you have to stand in line as normal creditors so one is you are running a credit risk it's like making a fd with a nbfc that is one aspect and secondly recently the tax provisions have been changed where earlier these gains could be treated as capital gains now these gains are treated as your regular income so if you are a very rich individual and having a lot of taxable income then you may end up paying taxes as much as 39% so notice two things that have happened one is your returns were 20% lower than the equity market returns second your tax is at 39% instead of the normal uh, 10% long term equity gain uh, long term capital gains on equity investments so both the returns are lower and taxation is higher so if you are looking at long term wealth creation then these may not be the uh, best vehicles to invest in if you are very very worried and if your time horizon is only 3 years then sometimes maybe yes you would consider products uh, like these and finally coming to art wine gold and all my thing is if you better to drink wine than to Uh, invest in wine or if you have gold wine biscuits and put it in the locker buy jewelry and 
wear it like puppy leri at least you can flaunt it so uh, i don't have much to say in the esoterics but this broadly covers the uh the alternative part and if you are interested in more please do keep coming to the forum we will have lot more sessions covering the other areas family businesses succession uh, mainstream investments and things like that thank you very much happy to take questions zoom audience also if there are questions you could let us know no questions that's great thank you very much thanks a lot whenever things got rough i always remember what my father used to say running a business does test to man my son there are ups and downs glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated the character of a man and the character of a business are not very different are they yes but when the chips are down we must stand up dust us heads off and more wrong volatility it's a funny thing it makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions sure you can question some of your decisions but stay steadfast on your goals dad always said there are no shortcuts and no quick profits there are no free lunches are there there is only one right way At PPFS we think like Rahul and his father that volatility is a fact of running a business and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business we use value investing principles to manage your money this means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term PPFS mutual fund there's only one right way mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully